Here we go. Good evening and welcome to tonight's CIS 205 PNI webinar. Tonight's webinar will be covering CompTIA's Network Plus exam and the specific to topic is Exam Objective 1.9. So what is Exam Objective 1.9? Well, it's Virtual Network Components. And tonight we're just going to be talking about some of the pieces of the virtualization puzzle that you may come across in your networks. So before we begin talking about the components, let's talk about hypervisor versus a virtual machine manager. So is there a difference between the two? Well, that, that's a yes or a no. A lot of it depends upon who you are or who you're talking to. Uh, Microsoft calls their, what I would call their virtual machine manager, they call it a hypervisor. Um, and those are the people that call any of the software packages that are used to manage virtual machines. They, some people will call those hypervisors. Other people, kind of like me, will differentiate between them. Um, and we are the more technically correct. Uh, virtual machine manager always requires a host operating system like Windows 8 or Windows Server, OS X or Linux in order to function. Uh, the operating system provides the environment in which the, the VMM, the virtual machine manager, runs. And that is, and the VMM is actually which manages, is actually the thing that manages the virtual machine. A hypervisor, on the other hand, doesn't require the use of an underlying operating system. It, it generally gets installed on a bare metal box and it provides the environment and also manages the virtual experience. <coughs> so those are the differences. They are, they are two different aspects. Uh, by the way, a virtual machine that's in a hosted environment is called a type 2 virtual machine, type 2 VM, while well, a type 1 is the one that's run off of a bare metal box. So now let's go ahead and move into the components. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the virtual desktop. And we kind of already basically outlined that, but you have two options. You can use a, a VMM and host the virtual machine locally, or you can use the thin client and host the VM remotely. Actually, there's, so there's four options there, or three, depending upon how you look at it. So let's talk about the local option. That requires a PC with an operating system, or you could have the bare metal box in your presence. Uh, it requires a virtual machine manager like VirtualBox, uh, Windows Virtual PC, or VMware Player, or if you happen to have a Windows 8 or Windows 8.1 machine with the right hardware, that would be Hyper-V. Uh, your remote op option, <coughs> now this one, uh, you would have a thin net or a thin client, excuse me. Uh, so you need to have that or you need to be able to emulate it. And it requires a means to serve up the virtual machine, kind of like a pre-installation environment, a pixie environment. And then you need a hypervisor like vSphere, HyperX, Zen Server. And one of the things, they should all be running on their appropriate hardware for the experience. So why would you want to run a virtual desktop? Um, a lot of people are using the virtual experience so that they can control their software licenses uh, a little bit better. Uh, they only end up paying for what they use. They don't have to have a lot of unused licenses on hand. Uh, it, 
increases the user experience or the consistency, especially when it comes time to troubleshooting and whatnot, because the administrator gets to decide which what software each instance is going to run. Uh, you, you can enjoy faster deployment. You can spin up a virtual machine pretty darn quick nowadays, uh, which leads to faster deployment. You have reduced administrative costs because you don't own the majority of the equipment or the, or the software, or you don't have to, but you can. Um, <clears throat> and you don't own a lot of the networking equipment, which can save you administrative costs. And you also get increased security when you're running stuff in a virtual environment. You get, an, you get a virus in your virtual environment, well, you just shut it down, and it's gone. Uh, you can actually sandbox the, the VM and infect it with viruses if you want with no risk to your real hardware or network. So now let's move on to some more, some more. Sounds like I'm cooking at the campfire. Some more components of the virtual environment. And we're going to start with virtual switches. So if you're running multiple VMs, well, then you're going to need a means for them to communicate together or to reach the outside world. You can do that by using a virtual switch. Now, virtual switches are software switches. Um, and virtual switches can be linked together, and you can create virtual LANs. And you can make your virtual switches actually span systems. You can actually have your virtual switch in one location connected to a virtual switch in another location communicating over a tunnel. So you can span things easily with virtual switches. So now let's move on to virtual servers. They are the same concept as a virtual desktop, except they usually have or run on more powerful systems, more powerful, powerful bare metal boxes. And virtual servers really do increase your efficiency in utilizing your IT resources. What I mean by that is you can, there is a model out there where you can rent computing time. And you actually only pay for the computing time or the server time that you're utilizing. You design the virtual server, you spin it up, of course, that's when the clock starts ticking. You do your stuff, you shut it down, you're done paying. That, that can be a whole lot more efficient, <clears throat> especially if you're in a startup environment where money's tight. I will say that there does become a point in time where using nothing but virtual servers does uh, lose its cost advantage, and it can end up costing you more money. Another item that you need to be aware of is the virtual PBX. What is a PBX? Well, that's a public, public branch exchange. That is a company's internal telephone system. It used to be in the old days that when you were a company and you had multiple phones and multiple lines, you had to have a P PBX, and they required some highly specialized, dedicated equipment in order to operate. Well, now your PBXs can be done virtually, and they can be done with software. Uh, <clears throat> my old company, we used uh, a virtual PBX. So my complete PBX uh, equipment was actually the size of a DSL modem, a standard DSL modem, and it worked great. We had uh, one in each location, and those things could handle eight separate phone lines and just a whole slew of extensions. Worked really great. Uh, it's actually saved us quite a bit of money, and virtual PBXs can save you a lot of money, too. Nowadays, you can actually uh, outsource 
your PBX needs. There are companies out there that are willing to to control your phone system for you, and that is usually run on a software as a service model. Well, that brings us to our next area that we're going to talk about, which is on-site versus off-site virtualization. So what's on-site virtualization? Well, that's where you have physical control of the computing resources. Uh, the organization has or is responsible for all maintenance of those resources. The organization is responsible for all of the administrative tasks that go with having those resources on hand. Uh, they have to troubleshoot them, they have to manage them, they have to pay for the power, so on and so forth. So an argument that can be made for on-site virtualization is you have more control over what is available to be provisioned uh, you get to decide what your boxes are. You get to decide uh, the hypervisor or the VMM, so on and so forth. And you have more control over your organizational data. Uh, all of your data resides in your storage media uh, where you have phys physical control of it. Uh, there are some, some security situations uh, where organization has to keep the data on site. They can't offload the data, so on-site virtualization would be for them. But there are some advantages to off-site virtualization. Well, in off-site virtualization, the organization contracts with a third party for their desired computing needs. The arguments for off-site virtualization is it offers more efficient utilization of IT resources, kind of like I mentioned earlier. You only spin up what you're going to use, which means you only pay for what you're using. You have increased flexibility. Uh, if you're getting ready to roll out a new marketing campaign and you Uh, highly flexible. You do have less administrative costs. That that third party that you're contracting with, they're the ones that are troubleshooting everything. They're the ones that are paying the power bill. They're the ones that are paying paying for the space that those machines take up. And space does cost money. And as I mentioned earlier, up to a point, offsite virtualization does lead to cost savings. Uh, another argument for off-site virtualization is you can pay, uh, if you're willing to pay a little bit more money for your storage needs, your virtualization, you can spread the clusters out so that in case one of your third-party sites goes down, your data is still up and running and your applications are still up and running. I will say that that model does end up costing you a little bit more money and people don't understand it very well. Uh, one of the things that I will say is you can you can think that you're paying for that redundancy only to have your stuff all residing in the same building even if it's on different equipment or it's residing within the same region as opposed to being in separate regions. It does cost more money. The more secure you make your redundancy, the more money it's going to cost you. One of the main concerns about off-site virtualization is the lack of control of sensitive data. Now, I'm pretty sure you've all heard of the uh, celebrities who lost their photos on iCloud. Well, guess what? That's off-site virtualization of, of storage in particular. Um, Apple had needed to carry some of the blame. The people who lost their photos needed to carry some of the blame. But that is one of the concerns about off-site virtualization is you don't have physical control of the data. 
So now let's move on to Network as a Service, or NAAS. And what it is, maybe. And why do I say that? Uh, well, because Network as a Service can be a little bit hard to define. It can be an umbrella term, which means that it can cover infrastructure as a service. That's where you contract your networking needs to a third party and you don't own your routers or switches. Well, you own a couple, but you don't own the majority of them. You're actually contracting out with them. Uh, then there's platform as a service. And that is where your um, virtual desktops would come into play. So you're actually you're actually virtualizing your operating systems that you're using and you don't have control of them, but then again, you're not paying for the licenses for them. There's software as a service. We mentioned that with the PBX. Uh, this is where you're doing your uh, CRM, uh, customer relations management package, or you're doing your ERP. Sometimes this is also called application as a service. Uh, but application as a service tends to be a little bit more specific and it's just one application that you're contracting with as opposed to a core group. So network as a service can be any one of those or it can be all of them all at once. Like I said, it really is kind of hard to define. One of the things that you just need to really realize is that networking as a service is a cloud computing model. Now that actually concludes the material that I have for this evening. Uh, are there any questions from the group? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, sure. Um, when you go to a, a one where a virtual uh, service to run all, let's say you're a small office and you have limited funds, mm -hmm. are these virtual services, can they be, are they, would you recommend them for a starter up business um, or do you recommend maybe a starter up business to first maybe have their own, own equipment for a while and then step up to one of these virtual uh, uh, services uh, basically to save, you know, to save money for the obvious reasons, I guess, of saving money and, and uh, um, also. <clears throat> okay, a lot of it depends upon how many phone lines you're going to have, how many extensions you're going to have, and what features you want. If you're a single person office, uh, it probably doesn't make much sense to go with a um, third party contract for your uh, PBX, mainly because you're one person. Uh, there's only so many phone lines that you can handle at one, any one time. Uh, it, as you grow, um, we had three sites. Uh, 65 employees, we were running 5, 10, 15, somewhere between 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 phone lines, uh, separate phone numbers for the company. And when we explored our options, uh, we still hadn't achieved enough critical mass to um, actually outsource all of the phone service of our PBX needs, so we actually bought uh, a hardware and software package to virtualize it in-house, and that was actually more cost-effective for us at that point in time. 